I'm a huge people person. So the coolest thing is being able to build a vision with a team, but then to be able to share it. So one of my key tenants is around transparency. I'm a huge believer. One of the biggest assets of any organization is its people. So I'm my philosophy, which I love to be able to, to share is around, is around that performance culture where it's transparent, it's empowered and accountability. So that's one of the, the things that I'm most excited about. This is Net Learnings, the podcast that keeps finance and banking professionals ahead of the curve. In each episode, we focus on career growth and practical advice while mixing in the occasional war story. Join us as we tap into the minds of leaders and experts at some of the world's most notable financial services firms and enterprises. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Net Learnings. I'm your host, Kyle Peterty. I'm really pumped to introduce our guest today, Rohit Mehta. Rohit brings nearly 25 years of experience in the asset management, mutual fund, and ETF world. And he was recently appointed president and CEO of Horizons ETFs, one of the earliest ETF providers in Canada, and currently the fourth largest by AUM. Rohit, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Kyle. It's great to be here. Yeah, and first of all, congratulations on on your appointment to the big chair. We'll we'll talk more about that later, but I'd love to just start by talking about Horizons ETFs. You made news recently by announcing, drum roll please, a no fee ETF. I think it's a zero MER, right? That's totally wild. And absolutely. So maybe I'll just start by talking a little bit about Horizons uh, ETFs, and then for sure you touched on a recent launch that's made a fair amount of news. So when you look at Horizons, Horizons ETFs, what we do is actually in our name. Horizons was, as you mentioned, one of the first ETF companies in Canada, and we are the fourth largest. And so we've been in this space in Canada for nearly 20 years. Today, we're managing north of $27 billion across 113 ETFs. Oh, wow. Now, as you just mentioned, we launched a suite of ETFs recently. And within that suite, one of the ETFs is our Equal Weight Bank ETF, and it's nine basis point management fee. But for the next 12 months, so ending July 31st of 2024, for the, so for that next 12 month period, it's zero management fee, zero MER. Is that literally the first of its kind? It is the first uh, here in Canada today. Having said that, if we go all the way back to ETF innovation in Canada. The first ETF in Canada in 1990, the TIPS, the Toronto Index Participation or the Toronto 35 Index Participation Fund actually was no fee. Oh, wow. Even back that, even that, all that time ago. Back then, and it wasn't terribly successful, but over time it has evolved and is now XIU, what is currently XIU, which is the largest ETF in Canada. Wow. Okay. And so tell us a bit about the company. You mentioned AUM. How many employees do you have? Are they mostly located in Toronto? Absolutely. We have 65 employees, mostly uh, located in Toronto. But as we do work with advisors across the country, we do have colleagues uh, that are across the country. I'd say also when we talk about Horizons, it's important to note that we are part of a much larger organization. We're part of Murray Asset, which is a South Korean-based organization and globally, as an organization, we manage over $700 billion of assets and awesome. over $100 billion of ETF assets globally. So here in Canada, we're the fourth largest provider, but globally, our footprint is even larger. That's great context. I appreciate that. I was actually going to ask about how Murray fits in, so that's helpful. What are kind of two or three characteristics that Horizons is sort of best known for? Because you're coming in new. Maybe you contrast that with like the old and the new. Right. So Horizons is a is an incredibly strong base. It's been an extremely successful organization over the nearly 20 years. And so in my view, there's an opportunity to really strengthen the foundation that we have to be able to build up for that next wave of growth. But that there's a current theme or there's a thread that is throughout the organization and that or permeates the organization, and that is around innovation. So innovation is something that is you know, germane to Horizons. It's actually also within our global DNA. So Murray, as we were just mentioning, actually stands for or means future 
in Korean. And when you look at Murray as an organization, globally, we pride ourselves as global innovators. So we, you can see that what we do here in Canada around innovation, we're going to continue to be innovators. And when we look globally, it's actually something that Canada should be incredibly proud of. When we look at the ETF space, I'd mentioned the, the first ETF in 1990. That was the first ETF in the world. It wasn't just wow. a Canadian innovation. And further to that, Canada has globally has been innovators around the first fixed income ETF, the first currency hedged ETF, and Horizon has been, has been proud to contribute to Worse here within Canada as well as well as globally. So overarchingly, that innovation fits so well within our global organization as well as within the Canadian uh, fabric. What are three or four of your most popular ETF products? Yeah, if you take a look, I mean, it, there's obviously time, things ebb and flow, you know, market backdrop. But right now, there's a few themes that we've seen significant amount of flow into. One is around cash management. We've seen volatility in the marketplace. We've seen the challenges just in terms of 2022. We saw the challenges around, you know, traditional fixed income as interest rates rise, challenges with duration. So we have a number of solutions, you know, whether that our high interest savings ETF with the ticker cash or our Canadian and US zero to three month T bill ETFs being C bill for Canada and U bill for the US have raised over a billion dollars combined, you know, year to date. And that's just a function of investors being able to get you know, 5% annual yield in a zero or virtually zero duration arena. So that's been one theme. The second one, which is which ties into broader trends just in terms of what demographics, et cetera, but has been around income through equity. So generating higher income through equities that might be low dividends or no dividend paying, and that's through covered calls. So our covered call lineup has seen a significant amount of growth. And in a covered call, what we're doing is you have a basket of of securities and will write calls on up to 50% of the portfolio on a regular basis. And when I say writing calls, what that means is you're selling away some of that future growth in order to gain cash flow. So as volatility increases, you you see those premiums that they're called on the uh, on the calls increase. And so, you know, we have, you know, our QQCC for example, which is on the Nasdaq 100 or on the in the energy space ENCC those are a couple of areas where we've seen significant growth. The third, the third theme, because you asked for two or three, so I'll give you three, is around enhanced exposures, if you will. So our enhanced ETFs, which is you're looking at whether it's, we're just talking about our new bank ETF, so HBNK, you can also, what we've done is introduced a series where you can have lightly leverage. So instead of one-to-one -one or 100% exposure, you get 125% exposure to that underlying, so to that, to that ETF for investors that are, that are looking for just slightly more return potential, obviously slightly more risk exposure as well. So that would be like BNKL, for example, where we use lightly leverage. Can I ask maybe a silly question or naive question? Sure. Um, would that incremental return on the product you just talked about come in the form of yield because of leverage or would it manifest as like potential gain? So that's a great question. It's actually both because what okay. we do is we own the underlying and then we, instead of owning, so HBNK is what it will own, instead of owning a dollar for every dollar in, in the lightly levered ETF, it will own a dollar 25 of it. So it's getting that additional dividend yield. It's also getting that additional capital exposure. Okay, got it. That, that's really yeah. helpful. All right. So maybe now that we're into the technical weeds a little bit, obviously a lot of people know ETFs exist and mm -hmm. many of them, I think, probably anchor relative to like a mutual fund. A lot of people know what a mutual fund is. This is a lower cost way to sort of access a variety of underlying securities. And so maybe you could really help explain like what is an ETF functionally? How, how does it work? Sure. So on its face, and we can spend a fair amount of time getting into the minutia. So happy to, happy to drill down as, as far as you like to go. But I think simplest for, you know, for viewers or for listeners is an ETF is a mutual fund that trades on a stock exchange. Okay. So you're pulling assets together it, like you do it in a mutual fund. It's going to own a basket of securities, bonds, equities, et cetera. And on a unitized basis, so multiple investors will own that mutual fund or that ETF, but buying and selling that takes place through an exchange. So on a mutual fund, you put an order in and you will get the net asset value at the end of the day for the 
$5,000 you put in to buy that, that mutual fund. On the ETF, you're going to buy that ETF on an exchange like the Toronto Stock Exchange throughout the day. So you could buy it at 9.45 in the morning or 12 noon or two in the afternoon, or you can sell it at those times as well at any point in time throughout the day. And it will be representative of the value of the basket at that point in time during the day. Got it. Okay. That's probably deep enough and really, really helpful. But one of the questions then that I have is if I'm buying a, an individual security, like a, a share of a, a bank, for example, the bid ask spread is a function of how much buying or selling pressure there is. How does the bid ask spread work on the ETF when it's like a measure of an underlying asset? Did, did you understand what I'm asking? Absolutely. That and That's a great question. So let's use your bank example. So you want to buy a share of one of the banks. We'll just keep, let's say that banks, the bid and the offer is $99.99 to 100 and a penny. So that's yeah. dead spread. Sure. So let's now just say that the ETF only owns that one bank. Yeah. So the ETF, instead of six, so what would happen is the ETF, you would want to buy it. The ETF would aggregate up. So in that case, just the one, the one security and the market makers will facilitate that. So you would go and you would pay in that case, what the market makers will do is they can create units. So it's the market makers that create the units. You would go to the exchange and you would see that ETF that only owns the one bank ETF and you would look to buy it. And the, the you'd be buying it at roughly $100 and one and a half cents or two cents. So if that's where the market makers, and that's how, and then selling would be the reverse. And so the market makers can, can create units on an ongoing basis. Now you would never do it just for one security because then right. you say, well, I would just go buy the security. But when they're yep. aggregating sticks or hundreds of securities together, that's how they are making and pricing the market throughout the day. Okay. It's definitely very nuanced. Even though they're sort of easy to understand on the surface, there's a lot goes on behind the scenes. There is a lot that goes on behind the scenes. So it's great that it's a simple, it's a simple transparent package, which is one of the yep. benefits of, of ETFs. But there is there is a, a number of, of moving pieces behind that make that whole ecosystem work. So Rohit, maybe you can help us understand the ETF world's like supply chain. I don't know how better to explain it. So again, we sort of started with like a bunch of publicly traded securities and then at the top and then at the bottom of the supply chain is like me and my retirement account, maybe an investment advisor suggested a particular Horizons ETF for me, HBNK we'll say. How does it sort of go from there to my portfolio? And the reason I ask is, you know, you often see folks in industry with a job with a with a title like wholesaler, right? Yeah. Or head of distribution or sales. Like if this is a product that an end user can purchase, where do all those folks fit in within the supply chain? And you can sort of weigh in. Sure. And this might be a, a, a multi-pronged question or, or answer, but let me start, you know, high level. An investor either, you know, does their own research and says, I want to go and purchase HBNK because I want to own the, you know, large Canadian banks on an equal weight basis. And so they decide they're going to buy HBNK or they work with a financial advisor and the financial advisor says, you know, Kyle, for your portfolio, I recommend HBNK. So in either of those cases, the purchase will be made through an account and through an exchange. So if you're doing it yourself, you're going to be with a discount brokerage and you would go into your discount brokerage account, which has access to the exchange mm -hmm. and exchanges. And so you would put in HBNK, you type it in the number of units you would want to purchase and the price that you'd be willing to pay. And you'd look within your, your discount brokerage screen to see what the bid ask spread is, what the bid and ask is, and then you'd, you'd purchase at the ask. And you would make that trade and then the back end would all work through going through the exchange, et cetera. And so in return, your account would move out the, let's call it the $10,000. And in return, you would get the unit value of 10,000 units, a dollar value of HBNK. The same thing would happen with, with you, the advisor in the case that Kyle that recommends to you to buy HBNK, they would say they would have, they or one of the members of their team would put the order in on their online system and make a purchase for your account. 
in the amount of $10,000. And it would be the same process. They would enter that trade. It would go to the exchange. They would be buying it at the ask. They would get those securities. The money would move out. The cash would move out of your account. And the, the units of the ETF would move into your account. Okay. So where does like a, where does a wholesaler or a distributor fit into the whole picture? Yeah. Great question. So wholesalers, so as a, as an organization like Horizons, there are thousands of financial advisors across the country that are working with individuals to help them, you know, build plans, meet their financial goals. The wholesalers support financial advisors. So we would work with them on, on a regional basis with helping them with understanding Horizons solutions and how that can, they can fit into portfolios to meet their clients' needs and objectives, keep them up to date on performance, changes, et cetera. And so really be their partner with all solutions related to Horizons, as well as industry trends, what's happening to be thinking about. So really just a partner in their business. And they'd be working with, with you know, a few different you know, wholesalers in that example, or a few different organizations. And so we would look to be one of those. Got it. Okay. So I want to make sure you're staying top of mind with the folks that are, yeah, so it's not, they're not actually distributing units. It's really just Correct. an educational process in some ways. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You talked a lot about innovation and, and it seems like you, both your firm and, and Murray are at the forefront of that. Without giving us your secret sauce, what are kind of some other innovative products that Horizons has on, on their radar? So that's a great question. There's, you know, if I look at, you know, not just at Horizons, but within Marais globally, I mean, we have monthly meetings where we have all the, the countries around the world that are part of Marais, those organizations working together. And we have one common, you know, product list, if you will, innovation list okay. in terms of things that we're, we're looking at. So I would position it in terms of, pose a specific solutions in terms of types of where innovation, where you're going to see it and the types of pockets you're going to see innovation. So when we have over a thousand ETFs here in Canada, someone might say, well, there's now there's just too many ETFs or, or where could you find innovation from? I think there's going to be three key themes where you're going to see innovation continue to come from in Canada and globally. One is around improved exposures. And our recent launch really highlights this. So where you would buy, I want to buy the six banks. I want to get exposure to six banks. We said, okay, you can buy the six banks on an equal weighted basis, but maybe you also want to buy them on, on a lightly levered basis. So getting 125% exposure, or maybe you'd like to generate more cash flow than the dividends are paying. So maybe you want, you know, BKCC, which is our covered call, or maybe you want covered call that's lightly levered. In which case right. we have that as well. So it's around that improved exposures so that people can be more specific in getting the right packaging that meets their portfolio needs. The second theme, and these three are not mutually exclusive. The second theme is going to be around liquid alternatives. Now, this is very Canadian centric. This okay. the liquid alternative regulatory framework came about in 2018 and was a significant milestone within Canada and actually speaks to the innovative landscape in Canada. It was really a collaboration between the regulators, the dealers, and the manufacturers, the asset managers, okay. in terms of a framework that is more sophisticated than your 81102, which is the same framework for mutual funds and ETFs, which is basically you can own securities on a long basis. Liquid alternatives allow for leverage. They allow for shorting. And so that is that was a new innovation, a regulatory framework that came about in 2018. And so that's where you're going to continue to see continued innovation around because it's a new and growing space in the Canadian marketplace. And the third key one is going to be around income. If we take a look at Canada, and this isn't just a Canadian centric thing, but we'll focus in on Canada since that's where we are. Demographics. We have an aging population here in Canada. We have an increasing longevity population in Canada. So in the next decade, 25% of the population in Canada is going to be 65 plus. That 65 plus grouping is also living longer. And we've gone from a period historically with defined benefit programs where people would retire and they basically have an income stream for life that was indexed to inflation. Now we've moved to generally, so there's a few pockets where there's defined benefit programs, but at large, is defined contribution plans. So those defined contribution plans help individuals as part of their employment build a nest egg 
that retirement nest egg till they get to retirement. But then a retirement says, okay, Kyle, here you go. Here's your defined contribution plan. Now you can use it to, to manage your retirement. But you have to manage, you are working with a financial advisor, have to manage that pool of capital to do two things. One, to provide you with your cash flow to live. The second one is also the sustainability to make sure that it's around as long as you live. So you're not just drawing down the principal. Correct. It's not as simple as drawing down the principal and it's getting more complicated with those three factors, aging population, increased longevity, yeah. and defined contribution programs versus defined benefit plans. So those are three really big trends. And you'll see solutions that, that will encompass or incorporate those three components or some will be just one or, or the other. Interesting. Yeah, I've heard that referred to as a demographic time bomb before. I'm not sure if you've heard that taxonomy. I haven't. I hope not. But I hope not too. Yes. I mean, that's what our role is as as asset managers is to work to help that contribute to that ecosystem, that retirement ecosystem, to ensure that it isn't the, it isn't the, the time bomb. Yeah. So just to reiterate, sorry. So the three are more tailored, yep. more improved exposure. So more ex tailored, tailored exposure. exposure. Yeah. Yep. Liquid, Liquid alternatives and yep. income. How does, if at all, does geography impact the ETF business? Like, are some more popular in certain markets? Is there a home country bias in the same way that you would see with, you know, stock pickers? For sure. Geography you know, and absolutely plays a part. And I would say if we just, if we focus in on, on Canada, you know, for example, you know, we have just from the culturally whatnot, we have a higher focus on an appetite for fixed income. So, you know, maybe you could argue that Canada is a more conservative investor group, but also you see that even in terms of investment selection. So in Canada, in the ETF space, nationally, we allocate as a country, as an investing country, you know, 52% of our total equity assets into Canadian equities. Now you say, okay, so that's, you know, one out of every $2 just over is going into a Canadian equity ETF versus global equity or international equity ETF. But why that's, why that is such a, such an important number is because Canada represents 3% of the global market capitalization. Right. Yeah. So that really highlights that home country bias. Now. There are some other factors that naturally lend itself to having home country bias. People are going to live their retirement here. They're going to be more related to the Canadian economy or more impacted by the Canadian economy at large. And so, and you also are all spending, people are spending most of the retirees getting the Canadian dollars, et cetera. Yeah. So there are reasons for that, but probably not quite as dramatic and as drastic as the biases that we, we have seen over the years and continue to see. I have to imagine that just the growing popularity, really the boom in like interest in ESG has kind of shaped the ETF landscape. Can you share a few ways that, that it has? How do you see that playing out in the next few years as well? So ESG has really come to the forefront globally and it's more, much larger than what I'd call an ETF. What we're seeing is within the ETF space or in the investment space at large, is that there are strategies that are coming out that are ESG focused, but the real push that you know I've seen is that the, in the ESG has really been implemented or embraced by corporations, and so how corporations run is becoming much more aligned with that environmental social governance, and that has led to candidly better organization. So it is instead of being more specific into ESG focused products, which if you think way back started off with really SRI and then evolved into yeah. it, it's now less so about let's have something that's ESG specific, but let's now understand how it's investing in order to invest in the best companies. And many of the best companies are ESG. So I think it's actually gone, you know, instead of where it started, SRI really started in an investment standpoint. ESG has actually started on the corporation and with companies being and, and doing a better job and needing that in order for, for public companies, particularly to actually be considered for investability. And so right. I think that ESG movement has almost, you know, leapfrogged over the investment side 
into the actual corporate and the corporation side. And we've seen much more research just around the, the benefits of ESG in terms of organizational success. Right. And mitigating risk and seizing opportunity. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. We teach a lot of uh, ESG content. So that's interesting to hear you say that. How about a quick game? What do you think? Sure. A get to know I'm you game. I'm up for okay. it. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's called the uh, lightning round. So it's okay. got to be quick. Okay. I'm going to give you a quick question. It'll be an either or. And then you just you just say what you're thinking. Say what's on your mind. Okay. So an, an example would be like chess or checkers, right? You just say, yeah, I like checkers or whatever. Okay. You ready? Sure. All right. You're going out for lunch. Yeah, I imagine you don't get a lot of lunches to yourself, but let's say you do and you're going to go down and you're going to sit by the lake. You getting a burrito or sushi? Sushi. Okay. Hip hop or jazz? Hip hop. Okay. What was your first job? I was mail uh, delivered flyers, newspaper flyers. Okay. Right on. Sweet or salty? Sweet. Okay. Favorite TV show? Favorite TV show? No pressure. That's a good one. Most recent one I was watching, my daughter was Blacklist. Okay. What's your hidden or secret talent? I'm good judge of character. Oh, I like that one. That was a good one. If you're hosting clients, which you, I don't know if you still have like a direct mandate, but over the course of your career, would you prefer to go to a hockey game or a baseball game? Hockey game. Okay. Growth or value? Growth. All right. Good. Good. I want. I'd give. I mean, I give you a ten out of ten. Like, there's no real. No, no. I, matrix. That was it, good, though. It was fun. I was trying to be very, just you know, genuine, top of my head, and and it, it's actually, those are fun. Any you want to expand upon? Sounded like you were going to say something about sushi. It's, I love, it was funny, I was, before we had this, I went down and I grabbed sushi for lunch. So I try to stay relatively healthy because I love, I love my steak and potatoes. And so I make a rule that I don't eat steak at lunch. Yeah. And so generally speaking, I'll have sushi or a salad for lunch every day that I'm not having a meeting. And even if I'm out for a meeting, it's, uh, I generally try to keep it into fish. Smart keep it guy. Low. Smart guy. All right, let's travel back in time a little bit to when you were more junior in your career, just starting out. What was it about the investment world that first attracted you? So it's a fun story. My parents- Love fun stories. My parents' financial advisor would come to our house and I, I remember it vividly. And one of these individuals is still my mentor. And so now he's retired, but we still chat today. And so when I was 13, he came over and I was asking him, his name was Andy, said, Andy, so tell me what a stock is and tell me what a bond is. And, you know, he, he was very patient and, and chuckled a little bit to himself. And he said, you know, you're really interested in this stuff. And I said, I just said, yes, I mean, I was 13 at the time. Yes. And he said, when you finish grade 11, which was the company's rule, you have a summer job with me. And that was my interest. And as soon as I, when I was in grade 11, I called up Andy and I said, do I have that summer job? And he said, absolutely. And so I never left the industry from that summer. I worked every single summer in the industry. And sometimes I also worked in the school year when I was at university and never left. Are you allowed to disclose the name of the firm? Sure. It was RBC Dominion Securities. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I know RBC DS well. I worked at commercial Rivers. at RBC. That's funny. And, and I was going to actually ask you a question because you have a very impressive track record of experience, right? I mean, you were with Van Growth, First Assets, CI Financial. That's a really, really solid name in the Canadian ecosystem. But your first job listed was as a Dominion Securities Associate Investment Advisor. And I wanted to get your take on what did you learn when you were working with high net worth individuals? Because to go back into kind of asset management away from client facing was a, a totally different move. So I'm curious sort of what were, what were your initial learnings in wealth management? My initial learnings, it, it was a fascinating time, it was around, you come in with, with assumptions. And so even at that young age, had assumptions about people's knowledge of investing and that financial literacy. So, you know, we were working with, you know, high net worth investors. So individuals have been very financially successful. Mm -hmm. But when people are financially successful, you know, in their careers, whatever it happens to be, they work really hard and they work really hard for one of the reasons is for wealth. But oftentimes don't actually know how to 
manage that wealth. Yes, they bring on financial advisors and they and they would come to, you know, groups that like I was working with. But I was still surprised on that level of financial literacy for people who were, you know, in the, on all frames very successful. And then you went into the asset management game. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your journey and kind of what you learned along the way in some of those stops? Sure. So it's actually, I mean, it's an interesting journey. So well, I worked from all my summers and school years at RBC Dominion Securities. When I graduated, I worked for RBC Dominion Securities. And then I was looking for a change. And I said, what would I like to learn? So I had learned a lot about the wealth management side of the business, the financial advice side of the business. You know, at Dominion Securities, I did everything. My first job there as a summer student in Toronto was, was in the mailroom. So I got to see the scope of Dominion Securities, you know, through delivering mail across wow. the organization, which was pretty neat. And it's a huge, very successful organization. And then I said, for my next journey, I'd actually like to be on the asset management side. So the manufacturing side, I was fascinated by how products get built, how they get brought to market, how they get distributed to one of your earlier questions. And I also saw the opportunity and said, I want to work for a smaller organization where I can see multiple facets and have, mul have broader exposure to the organization, particularly as I was still relatively young at a school at that point in time. And from then, I saw, had the opportunity at, at Vengrowth. What's interesting that sometimes that, you know, your LinkedIn or, or CV does, it doesn't say is that that was 2001. From then until, until 2020, I didn't actually change firms. Oh, they were acquired. I was, I was acquired through okay. Vengrowth. We launched a business called Criterion Investments. That was purchased by First Asset. And then First Asset was purchased by CI. Ah. And so it was an interesting journey that had a ton of experience and exposure and worked with some in incredible people. But actually, it changed business cards along the way, but was through that, that acquisition process. A loyal guy. So you were actually with really one firm that whole time. In some Correct. Ways. It's in some ways. In some ways. Yeah. What does career progression look like in the mutual fund and ETF world? Like, can you sort of map from like an entry level type, maybe an analyst role, all the way up to like an SVP or director type role? Sure. It's not always linear. But let me start there, and I'd say that there's there's generally a few different tracks. So for people who want to be portfolio managers, generally speaking, they'll come in. They join an organization as an analyst. They would finish their university degree. They'd be completing their CFA, maybe a master's degree, and they'd be working as an analyst. And then they would be getting more and more exposure and working their way towards being an associate portfolio manager and then a full portfolio manager. So that's generally the portfolio management track. On the business side, it is much more disparate in terms of the path for people to move into the you know SVP or, or director roles, as you had mentioned. Individuals can come through a variety of, of areas because that's really on the business side of it, if you will. So come through sales, can come through finance, come through marketing. It mm -hmm. really, it's where that exposure to elements of different parts of the business and oftentimes people are going to have more exposure. So might start off in sales and then increase the portfolio. I mean, that was my career. So it started off, you know, in sales and sales management, then distribution, whereas sales and marketing, and then strategy and so on and so forth. And then opportunities to run organizations. Which is what you're doing now. And again, congratulations. I, I, Thank you. I have to ask, what's the number one coolest thing about, about being CEO and what, and what do you find most challenging? I'm a huge people person. So the coolest thing is being able to build a vision with a team, but then to be able to share it. So one of my key tenants is around transparency. I'm a huge believer. One of the biggest assets of any organization is its people. So I'm my philosophy, which I love to be able to, to share is around, is around that performance culture where it's okay. transparent, it's empowered and accountability. And so driving that through. So that's one of the, the things that I'm most excited about. And, and I'm a big, huge team player. So working as, as a team, and, and in my view, teams win. What's the most challenging is the responsibility, candidly, that, that comes along with it. There's a lot of people that are relying on, on myself and on the leadership team. And I take that responsibility very seriously, whether it's, you know, speaking to you today, Kyle, you know, on a podcast, 
or, or, you know, meeting clients or working on product, everything that we do is, I know it's, there's a responsibility that comes along with that, which I enjoy, right. but it is, it is challenging. For sure. What is it they say? Heavy is the head that wears the crown. <laughs> And so over the course of your career, you you were an individual contributor, obviously a very good one, and you did some people management, and now you're, of course, the ultimate people manager. What advice do you have for folks that are kind of looking to make that transition from an individual contributor to a people leader type role within an organization? I think it's working with, I mean, you talked about this earlier. It's, it's the, when we touched on it, just around mentors. Speak to people, ideally, that have known you for a long time or that you've worked with and ask them what kind of skill sets you have from a management standpoint that they can help you hone in on. And then asking for opportunities to work on projects, lead small teams, so you can show the the contributions and, and hone those strengths there. So that idea of starting small, not aiming to go from, you know, here to there, but how do you take on individual projects, et cetera, that give you that, that management exposure. And then I think it's also just putting up your hand. Not everyone enjoys managing people. Right. And so, you know, you might be in a role where you're excellent at what you're doing and someone, you know, your, your manager at that point in time will say, that's, that's great. Kyle's excellent at this. Let's keep moving on board, but not knowing that, you know, Kyle wants to do something else or would like to manage people and to get that exposure there. So I think it's important communication. Go back to you know, that transparency, communicate right. what it is that your career paths are. And, and maybe there's, you'll get advice from mentors, managers, et cetera, on, on areas that you need to develop in order to take that next step. If they don't feel like you're ready and if they feel like you're ready, you'll, you'll get opportunities. That's sage advice. What do you consider the biggest miss of your career? And, and what did you learn from it? That's an interesting and, and tough question. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career, but if I look back, it's making sure that you stop to smell the roses. That okay. idea of embrace the journey and love that journey that you're in. I look back on my career and there were so many wonderful times that I had over my career that when I was in the moment, I didn't enjoy them enough. Mm. And so how do I leverage that today? If you will, I do it a few full. What is I build vision boards so that I know where, when I achieve goals, I make sure that I'm very proud of them. And I actually share that with my kids is it doesn't matter what you're looking to do, set your goals, make sure you're having fun, do something that you love and be grateful for whatever it is that you're doing and be present. And even, even with, um, with my kids, making sure that you're present. So that's, I guess those are just things that you, you kind of learn over time. But that's one thing, you know, if I look at, you know, the 20 plus years that you were mentioning, which makes me feel old, but in, in my careers is I've been very fortunate and I, and I could have enjoyed some of those moments more. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Thanks for opening up about that. It's, it's true. You can really miss the forest for the trees if you're not careful and it feels like you've just time traveled through your career and you got to make sure you're enjoying it. What's something I can do to help you? I think this is, you know, what you're doing, even as we're having a conversation today is, is important. That right. idea of increasing that educational front, you know, as I talked about working with high net worth investors and many people just didn't, you know, were very successful, but didn't know, or were not well-versed in, in wealth management. So I think continuing education, it's one of the reasons that, that I'm happy to join you here today. If there's ways that I can contribute and so you have a whole slew of, of, participants, you have a ton of material, courses, et cetera. I think, you know, continue to do the great work that you're doing and giving, you know, individuals like myself an opportunity to spend some time with you. So thank well, you. Well, thank you. We, we certainly appreciate all, all of your wisdom and insight. One question that I like to ask all my guests, if you weren't doing what you're doing, what would you be doing? I wasn't doing what I'm doing. I would be a uh, travel blogger. I love... <laughs> Love it. I love I love traveling. I love people, and I love immersing myself in different cultures. So I think that would be really fun. Maybe I start an emerging markets fund and give you an excuse to to travel exactly. a little bit professionally. Fair enough. That's wonderful. Listen, Rohit, thank you so much for your time today and your insight. Really, again, greatly appreciated. All the best to you and your firm. 
for anyone that's interested in learning more about Horizons ETFs or about Rohit, please make sure you check out horizonsetfs.com. Thank you so much, Kyle. Really appreciate it. It'd be a pleasure joining you today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Net Learnings. This podcast is powered by CFI, an organization on a mission to enhance the skills, knowledge, and productivity of finance and banking professionals. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode, make sure to follow Net Learnings wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit us online at corporatefinanceinstitute.com slash podcast. See you next time.